Samurai, what is happening, Cryptosomniacs? It is Thursday, December 20th. Happy holidays to everybody. Hope you guys are all doing great. Uh, we are here today going to have an interview with Horizon co-founder, uh, Rolf vs. Lewis. Hope I said that right. Uh, let's just get to it right here on Cryptosomniac. Stay tuned. And all right, what is happening, guys? Just giving it a second here to get some uh, people rolling into the chat. And uh, let me bring up our guest for the day. Rolf, what is happening, my man? Thank you for making time. Uh, welcome to Cryptosomniac. And uh, uh, yeah, let's just go ahead and jump into it. You want to you wanna give everybody a brief introduction? Uh, you know, introduce yourself. Yeah. And, and, uh, Thanks, Jason. No, happy, happy to be here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm definitely uh, involved and co-founded with Horizon. I've been doing a bunch of different things in the cryptocurrency space in the last few years, including mining. Before that, I, um, gosh, I started out as an officer in the Navy on a submarine out in Hawaii, running nuclear power plants and worked for Cisco Systems, did networking, voice over IP stuff, started a business with that and grew it and sold it. And I like being in fast moving new industries because it's a lot of fun. And uh, so I had the opportunity to jump in the cryptocurrency industry about three years ago. And uh, here we are having a great time going through a full market cycle as it were. Right. Yes. Uh, lots of uh, lots of people have been uh, sadly losing interest. So I guess we have we have very, very clearly shown how many people were really in it for the tech and who was in it. Uh, for the money. I think it's hilarious when people say that they're in cryptocurrency and they're not in it for the money um, because it is money, right? And uh, so that's always <laughs> a humorous thing to me. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I always find that humorous. But um, it's it's cool to see how many people really have uh, stuck around and, and furthermore, how many projects have continued to develop and release things and, and you know, just make moves uh, in the protracted bear market. So um, speaking of which, uh, I know you guys recently just came out with the new wallet. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? I, I thought it looked pretty nice. We did. You downloaded the, the beta. Yeah. Oh, it's great that you downloaded and you used it. Yeah. It's uh, called the Sphere Wallet. And um, one of the things that we're uh, doing at Horizon is trying to make it easy for people to use uh, privacy um, enabled cryptocurrency like Horizon. Uh, it's got messaging, it's got uh, the ability to be a light uh, wallet, a full wallet. Um, it's, it's, it's a slick looking wallet, great user interface. It is nice. um, oh yeah. And uh, good cool. coloring, good, good back and forth. And, um, it uses to, to create addresses. It uses a 24 word phrase, uh, which is a little bit new in the ZK snark wallet space. Uh, so you can just, if you need to recreate your address on a different wallet, you can use it using, you know, the 24 words to recreate it. Um, so that's a great step forward. And it's the application because it's right now it's starting out as a wallet and communication device, but it's the application that's going to lead uh, for us to be able to do lots of different things, professionally developed, uh, uh, extensible, expandable, and we're going to be able to put it on mobile devices as well. Same version. Very cool. Yeah, I was going to ask. I noticed it was. Uh, it seemed like it was only desktop available right now. So, uh, but it does look pretty slick. I mean, you know, it's got a nice uh, heads up display, I guess to call it. You know, it's seeing the the tweet panels and uh, showing status on the nodes, uh, secure nodes and super nodes, what's running. And so, I, I just thought it was pretty cool. Um, I know um, I was reading about further plans to be able to uh, select between running a full node or a light client when you're on there. So. Uh, Again, I'm not a I'm not a, uh, a big time mining guy, but uh, I know you have a mining background, so maybe talk about that a little bit and why people should be, even be yeah interested in that. Oh sure, well I mean the regarding the the wallet itself, so it's great because you can just start it. It's up and running on 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 light mode. The the problem with light mode is you can only use transparent addresses. And of course, we have transparent and shielded addresses. So for right now, to do shielded addresses, where the private anonymous transactions and, and communication come from. 
um, you got to run uh, a full node. Now, that running a full node on this wall is very easy. It's just a selection box, yep. and it either copies over the existing Horizon blockchain that you have if you're running Swing Wallet or something like that, or, or it downloads it. And it can take a little while to download it, but then you got the, the full power of uh, everything. One of the improvements that we're hoping to make in the next uh, 6 to 12 months is to be able to, on the light version, do the shielded transactions as well. And that's part of the reason we have a uh, node network. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I do a lot of mining as well. And, and that's, you know, that, that's a great way to get into the space, at least it was for me here in uh, the state of Georgia. We got a lot of hydropower, good uh, low price electricity. I was going to say power that helps. It's uh, not the most profitable endeavor in California. So uh, uh, that's what I hear. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But interestingly, that's why uh, we came up with the idea of paying people to operate nodes, because we have an international group of folks. And uh, California, very similar to Germany, high electricity costs. And there's people that want to engage in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, they can't be miners because the electricity is too expensive. Uh, they're not investors because they don't have the, the deep pockets and they're not developers. But there's a lot of uh, IT guys, system administrators, other folks like that that are really technical. The guy that, uh, or, or woman at that, if you're at work, fixes the printer, gets your laptops going, runs the backend servers. Mm -hmm. And those are the guys that uh, we pay them to operate nodes and they're very good at running nodes. And who better to have a, on your team and being a supporter than all the tech guys at your local businesses. Makes sense. Uh, good, good vector for adoption, certainly. Um, yeah. So, uh, what else? Uh, what else has been going on at Horizon? Um, so, I, you know, there's there's something I want to talk to you about. We can get to it later. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you know. We had one of the uh, Monero community members on yesterday, just talking about uh, what's been going on, and and uh, so so specifically, you know, we we again we can get to this a little bit later, but I wanted to talk about that new RFP to uh, crack the privacy protocols. Specifically, they, they called out uh, Zcash and Monero, but uh, I believe that Horizon is a fork of Zcash down the way. So um, if I'm not mistaken, perhaps uh, that should be something that the community should be aware of. And should anybody be concerned about it? I don't, we, we can get into it now if you want. Oh yeah, I mean, let's 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 talk about it. I mean, that, that's uh, that's good and bad. It's it's good that uh, there's recognition that um, that these privacy uh, enabled cryptocurrencies like Monero and Zcash, certainly two of the leaders in, in the industry uh, on it from market capitalization uh, are, are getting the attention. Uh, it'll be a good test too. Yes. And actually that's one of the things that when we started, because we are a, you know, a fork of a fork. So we started, Correct. Z Classic was a fork of Zcash and we forked off Z Classic in uh, May of 2017. Great way to start, instant community, right there on exchanges right away. Uh, Bitcoin Cash did a little bit later on, but you know, um, uh, it, it was a good way to start, and um, our our mission is to make sure that as people start to use Zen more and more for private transactions, first of all, we want to make it easy to use, um, and that's why we have uh, easy to use wallet. That's why we have twenty four by seven support. We have a very active community. Uh, we're working to get into point of sale applications and go out to different communities and different. Um, we we'll call markets of people who would want to use these uh, more than you know just people that are regular, part of the regular banking system. But then, what happens if we're successful? What happens if we're successful? Well, um, maybe some people don't like that we're uh, giving people to be able to do private cryptocurrencies, and right. maybe they'll ridicule us. Maybe they'll attack us. So, for for the very get go, we designed to be um, set up to be attacked, and there's a few different ways to do that. Um, one of them is to get all the nodes up and running and worldwide so that we can't do a denial of service. Another is to have miners all over the world distributed with a very uh, powerful mining system, open source application, a team. Uh, but then we have to take all the different things that we do and decentralize it. So there's no, you know, throat, one throat to choke or one central right. point of, uh, right, sure, of control. Sure. And yes. we're not there yet. We're a work in progress. We're semi decentralized. Right now we have a strong a team that's working to do development and, and rolling it out, but we're not as decentralized as say Monero is at this point. They're a more advanced project. Um, however, the, what we're doing with enabling side chains 
uh, moving the voting system for control of the Zen Treasury to the side chains and moving the uh, tracking and payment of the secure nodes to the side chains. Once we get that accomplished, hopefully in about a year or so, we'll have everything pretty much decentralized. And if somebody from the NSA or, 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 or one of the uh, guys I worked with in the past when I was an officer in the Navy comes to me and says, hey, uh, we need you to kind of slide a back door into this. I'd be like, I'm out. The rest of the team's going to have to, you know, carry it on. We're a decentralized project. I can't, you know, be right. part of that. Well, and it's, so that's, uh, that is one thing. So, uh, you know, obviously – uh, being a cryptocurrency guy, we're all fans of decentralization just overall. But um, there, there certainly is something to be said about an aspect of centralization, at least at the outset, trying to uh, get projects going. And I mean, you can just look to, you know, examples, whether they're good or not, you can look to examples uh, in traditional tech like Apple or, uh, you know, Facebook, even Microsoft, all of these, they do have some figureheads that are sort of helping make decisions. And then if you, if you look at that over on, you know, apply that to crypto projects, there's, you know, obviously Vitalik over at uh, Ethereum and uh, Ch Charles at um, IOHK and Cardano. And, and perhaps, uh, you know, maybe it's easier to actually get things done uh, when there's one person sort of leading the vision or at least, uh, one democratic group leading the vision. Um, so do you, do you find that? And then talk about like specifically speaking of these side chains and the governance mechanism, uh, does anybody who holds Zen have the ability to shape the way that the platform develops? Yeah. So I, first of all, I agree with your point that a certain amount of centralization at the beginning to develop uh, the technology that's new and different technology that's not already out there that you can just copy is completely necessary. Um, when we started, we actually had one developer who immediately turned around and left and attacked the project. We had no developers, uh, fortunately. <laughs> and, and we're like, well, uh, is there any developers in the community that want to step forward? And a couple did with some uh, small projects here and there, but the major development things that we needed, we needed good developers with C++ and blockchain experience technology. Fortunately, uh, Rob Viglione and I uh, had met uh, Charles Hoskinson uh, at Consensus before we launched and talked to him, um, and he was a, a, a supporter, uh, not through IOHK, but just, you know, as Charles originally. Sure. Um, and he, he provided one of his development teams to help us early on get through some of the early issues. And then uh, all uh, 2017, when the price of Zen was high, we were able to contract a couple of uh, what we think are groundbreaking uh, research and modeling uh, things with IOHK. One was the development of the treasury. So a team of academics studied what Dash has done with their treasury uh, and then came up with a, a different model based on uh, zero knowledge proofs and bullet proofs uh, that they then modeled for us. And that we have a white paper from IOHK on that. And that's what we're going to be implementing on the side chains. The second major project that IOHK is doing for us uh, is researching a block DAG. So we're looking at potentially switching from, this would be at some point in the future, it would be a very major software upgrade um, from a blockchain to a block DAG, which is a proof of work uh, directed acyclic graph, which would make the transactions a lot, a lot faster. And so the research and modeling is important. And then we've, uh, we're working with a, a great um, a blockchain focused uh, C++ development team out of Ukraine um, called InfoPulse to do the major system upgrades. And then we have, uh, we've, been able to fortunately over the last uh, year build a good internal development team too. And even though the price of Zen has gone from, I think, a high of 60 down to five uh, over the last year, it's coming back up. Um, we've, we've, we've reduced our expenses a lot. No really any um, sponsorships and cut back on, on going to any projects, but we're still focused on paying developers and releasing new products because that's important and that's what kind of makes the difference. I concur with that point. I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, obviously 2017 was the year of marketing and uh, with Ethereum and other things coming out that made it so easy to go ahead and launch a project. Um, uh, obviously, there there were problems that came along with that. Um, I, I think it, you know, again, going back to, I think it speaks to um, the point of which projects were actually worth paying attention to, uh, who kept developing things as their token value uh, decreased. And, and, and additionally, I, I like the idea that you guys had treasury management. I mean, I think that's something, you know, we talk about that in our group all the time. That was a, a, a huge problem. I think a lot of people were just banking on the fact that Ethereum was going to continue to 
go bonkers forever and, uh, you know, ultimately weren't being smart about uh, projecting and, and protecting their rays. And, and, you know, I think maybe we saw a little bit of the result of that in the resulting fire sale over uh, the course of a couple of times this year. Um, yeah, we could have probably done a little bit better. We could have, you know, hedged here and there and, and done a better job of that. And we'll certainly look at doing that in the future. Sure. Um, but yeah, there's right. something to be said for spend when your token's worth a, a lot on something. Don't just sit on it either. So. Yeah, sure. So we've we've got a couple of uh, we've got a couple of questions from the audience. Um, in fact, we've got a we've got one of our team members. It's actually very interested in in the Horizon project in general. Uh, so two questions. Is Horizon, is Horizon trying to be a platform for dApps of all types, not just communications and media? Because again, it seems like obviously with Zen Chat, Zen Pub, and I mean, I know Zen Hide, uh, we can talk about that a little bit. If I'm not mistaken, that's more of like a, a shield for being able to, I don't know, get around the Great Firewall of China, for example. Maybe. And, and that was the initial idea. And, and the technology was there for domain fronting. And, and meanwhile, the since then, domain fronting has pretty much gone away. Um, uh, but just uh, uh, decentralized applications. So let me tell you a little bit about how we're going to do that. Um, so first of all, um, our uh, lead developer for uh, is our architect, uh, Alberto Garofalo and uh, Robbie Leon published a white paper on how we're going to do our side chains. Um, and so side chains, of course, we lock up a certain amount of Zen and then we put it and operate it and do a bunch of things with the Zen and then bring it back in later. And, we want to make sure that we don't bring back more Zen in than was locked up and sent out on the side chains. Um, and then right. it doesn't, and that way the main chain doesn't have to care about what happens to the Zen on the side chain. So that's, that's the first thing we're going to uh, update the Zen code to be able to support side chains. So I just want to put that out there that we've given this a bit of thought. Um, then we're developing two applications on the side chains initially internally, as well as uh, developing a, um, uh, a software development kit for third-party developers to do it. Uh, and this, um, the two applications, I already alluded to them earlier. One of them is the treasury and governance voting system. Um, and there's the white paper that IOHK published on that, but the uh, simple part of it is people are able to buy voting tickets. Uh, and then there's going to be a proposal period. Then there's going to be a voting period. They're going to vote uh, using zero knowledge proof. So it's going to be secret ballot voting. Votes are going to be counted, um, and then the results are going to be published. So unlike some of the uh, other voting systems out there, uh, you can't see what the votes are while the voting's happening. Uh, it's uh, and that way the system help, help can't prevent be collusion. I was going to say. I mean, I, I guess the one concern there is: are you uh, are you at all concerned with uh, an oligarchy forming just because um, you know vote producers? I mean, similar to look what happened with EOS, right? For instance, that's a delegated proof of stake system, and you had block right. producers specifically saying like. Hey, we're a block producer. You know, you can you can bribe us and we'll vote your way. <laughs> and you know, so is is there any fear of that or how? You know, again, uh, I mean, I, I don't think it's any secret that uh, earlier this year there was some trouble before the rebrand, et cetera. So, um, you know, what what specifically do you have any concerns of that? And 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 what uh, what new mechanisms in the governance are going to be there to to help prevent that sort of a thing? Sure. So first of all, it's going to be a, a form of liquid democracy where you don't have to just vote. You can have the ability to vote uh, and then uh, proxy or say, well, this if it's on this topic, I'm going to have this just my vote follow this person's vote. Uh, so you can choose experts and have them follow the vote. Um, the next thing is we're not just going to immediately uh, dump over all the contents of the Treasury to voting and say it's a free for all. We're going to roll this out progressively. Uh, and we're going to discover issues and problems, and then we're going to work to uh, put together a, a governance and voting system as we go on uh, that matches it. Next, there is absolutely going to be politics, collusion, um, probably blackmail, you know, anything goes in politics. Um, <laughs> and so I expect that the Zen Blockchain Foundation, which currently gets the Treasury and turns around and does all this thing, at some point in the next few years is going to be completely voted out and somebody else uh, is going to uh, be able to run things for a while. Maybe we'll carve it up into different functional areas like um, uh, development and marketing and things like that. But no, I mean, to give full control of uh, uh, the, the project to the owners of Zen, it, it means we have to actually give full control of it. Right, certainly. Well, and, and uh, I mean, that, I think that's something that, that people forget is like the whole point of 
a truly decentralized system means that it will evolve sort of naturally in, in its own way uh, by default, by nature. That's that's what it's going to do. Right. It might turn out to be a lot better than the things that I might have envisioned for it or, or other folks might have envisioned for it. Um, you know, we get a system out there and we start, in, in some cases, we're surprised by who wants to use it or what they're doing with it or where the most traction is. And you just, you just kind of kind of throw the spaghetti on the wall thing and see what sticks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's talk about, uh, you know, you had mentioned you guys had a little bit of a affiliation with Charles and IOHK. Um, do you t talk about that relationship a little bit? How has that helped you? Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I've I've. We've interviewed Charles on the channel before. Um, I've seen him speak a bunch of times. Uh, seems like a super nice guy. I, I didn't get to speak with him, but uh, um, mm -hmm. I'm always inter uh, interested to hear him speak. He's got a great perspective. Um, how has how has the affiliation helped Horizon? Uh, and I agree with you. I, I have uh, all sorts of respect uh, for, for Charles Hoskinson. Um, I don't talk to him much uh, every once in a while. I know I could reach out to him and talk to him if I wanted to. Uh, Rob does that periodically. Sometimes there's big issues or advice or introductions or working with uh, different, uh, he's really as, as part of IOHK, and I guess they're going to move to Wyoming. Uh, so uh, oh. IOA, IOWI, ah. uh, just because of all the new legislation there. Yeah, right, yes, I know there's been huge moves. Uh, first yeah. started learning about that at uh, Blockchain Unbound last year, I guess it was, or early this year. Yeah, early but they've really put together a great team of academics and developers and uh, folks in the space. So it's great to be able to tap into that. Uh, having said that, it's what we're doing uh, at Horizon. A lot of it is just uh, what we're doing, but it's nice to know that we can have access to more advanced uh, capabilities, research, um, and experience advice when we need it. Having a little more brain share, if you will. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I didn't want to skip your question of third-party uh, distributed uh, decentralized apps. Yeah, let's, so let's after talk we about develop that. the voting system and... Um, and then we're going to do the our second major one, which is uh, tracking and payment of the secure and super nodes. Uh, and then we're going to open it up to other people to be able to develop. And the idea would be we'll have uh, it'll be we have twenty five thousand servers out there, nodes. About four thousand of them are very capable servers that are super nodes, and those would be the ones that would be running these different side chain apps and hoping to make a little bit of extra zen to do that. So an example of something that you may want as a decentralized um, application, perhaps a VPN system. You know, I, I use VPNs, but I know they go through a service. I don't, they say they're not doing logs or anything like that, but I don't really know. Um, it, instead of having that be a fully, you know, vetted decentralized system that is worldwide and doesn't have a single point of control. Uh, and there's other types of application in the privacy space uh, that are uh, good for that. I mean for we can do messaging and chat. And so if you can have the Sphere wallet and you can reach the Zen blockchain, you can send fully private or even anonymous messages to people. That goes on the main chain. Maybe we want to have, you know, a small anonymous chat group that does a lot of back and forth and shares pictures. That would be a great side chain application. So there's a, a lot of other things like that. And we, we need to throw it open to third party developers within uh, with the development and, and, and way to get onto the system because there might be something out there that we haven't even thought of that would be just taken off. So, so what do you guys, uh, what's the ETA for having the SDKs ready and, and having them up on the site? I mean, uh, here, I've actually got the site up over on my other browser here, so we can post Yeah, I've been in, 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 in different technical fields for a while. So usually whatever my estimate is, uh, it takes like three to four times as long. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my guess is, based upon development and all sorts of different things like that, my guess is we'll spend most of 2019 uh, doing these in internal ones. So I'm, I'm looking that there's going to be an SDK out starting sometime in, in 2019, and then the ability to actually do the uh, decentralized third-party apps probably closer to the end of 2019, maybe 2020. I mean, we're you know multi-year project in development. It's exciting when we uh, make improvements and release upgrades but we've also got to be realistic that some of this is pretty complex stuff and takes a while to develop. I think people forget that, right? Rome isn't built in a day. And uh, again, with with a lot of people having come into crypto in the short run up of 2017 and, you know, thinking that, I, I guess, uh, 
you know, I mean, let's be honest, there was a lot of hype. People were sold a lot of magic pills. Uh, a lot of it turned out to be bullshit, frankly, but uh, some of it, I, I think a lot of people just, they saw, oh, another landmine here and there, another landmine, and they're just, it's, it got so easy to, uh, through the chaos, to just miss the people that were, that were actually buckling down and working and have been working and have been developing. I mean, I myself have fallen guilty to this uh, as a trader, taking a, you know, I, instead of taking a long-term investment mindset, taking the short-term day trade, swing trade, like I've, I've uh, 86, several projects that I thought, you know, just as a, you know, I've closed my positions uh, specifically because I was like, this is crazy, nothing's happening. And, and realistically, you know, again, it's just the impatience of realizing that, this stuff is very complicated, especially when you're talking about things with uh, goals for interoperability between blockchains. A blockchain is a very complicated thing uh, just in and of itself. So building the technology that can operate uh, at a commensurate level with what we have now. And, you know, I, I say this all the time is um, until grandma until grandma can pick it up and use it like Venmo, it's just not there yet for most of this stuff. But uh, we've seen, I think, by leaps and bounds, even just in the last couple of years, the user experience has, has gotten significantly better. Um, uh, I, I completely agree with you. And it's still a young technology. I was just listening yeah. to a lecture yes. from Andreas Antonopoulos about that. And he was talking about using email back in the early 90s. Uh, but certainly his grandmother couldn't use it back then. But now she, you know, just does email on an iPad sure. with, a, with a swipe. But My grandma texts is, messages. It's crazy. She's like right. 90. It's, you know, like, but that's also 15 years later. What can you have to, what, 25 years later? Yeah, Gosh, 25 right. years later. Uh, you, you know, so it takes a while. This, this, uh, Sphere software, uh, this, that, that we have that we released, we've been working on that since early January of 2018. I mean, this is a, a long time in progress. Yeah. And, uh, even though we say, okay, here's what it is now, and there's going to be all these features. We have people that can jump into the Discord or on Telegram. They're like, I thought it was going to do all these things. And we're like, yes, yeah, not it's going to do all these things. <laughs> just hold on. It's getting there. Yeah, just not tomorrow. <laughs> we, we're working. Yeah, we're an actively traded cryptocurrency. We can't do updates and just fling them out there. Every time we do a hard fork update, it's like 30 different exchanges, all sorts of different partners. Well, then every node has to upgrade, right? I mean, as soon as a hard fork, this I think I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people that are involved in cryptocurrency don't they say they're in it for the tech, but they don't, they just like, they hear the sales pitch part, you know, like the top mm -hmm. of the, you know, oh, it gives me privacy online. They're like, cool, I support that. But they don't actually look into what it takes, like, you know, running full nodes and what it means that on a consensus network, when there is a hard fork and an upgrade, that means the entire network has to install the upgrade for it to, to take effect realistically. It does. We've gotten it down to a process. Time. We have a, an upgrade, a mandatory upgrade scheduled for uh, January 19th. But that means... That we have to have software published for everybody to start loading onto their servers two weeks ahead of time of that right. which means two weeks ahead of time of that we have to have it to test net so we can run it on test net and make sure it's okay so pretty much uh, almost a month before the hard fork upgrade we have to have the final version of that software ready to go that's if we want to do it in a responsible manner you know we can do emergency hard forks but if every time you do an upgrade it's emergency people are like you know, do those guys really know what they're doing? Yeah, I was going to say that's not. I mean, you know, the 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 uh, what was it? Uh, the how should I say? Unintended hard fork that Verge had earlier this year. Uh, you know, not even realizing that that was the result of the code fix because of their attack. Mm -hmm. you know, just things like that. I mean, there's there's a lot more complicated components to it. And, I, and I'm not a developer, so I you know again don't. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to speak out of school or act like I'm any kind of expert that I'm not. Um, but, you know, I read a lot of white papers. I've, I've helped to write a couple. I, I understand this stuff conceptually, at least. And uh, the more I talk to people that do know what they're talking about, that are actually building the technology, um, the more and more complicated I realize what this stuff really is. And, and you know, it's going to take a while to, to get it to the user experience point. But... Once it does have, I mean, I, effectively, once it has a commensurate user experience with things like Cash App, PayPal, Venmo, whatever, uh, to be able to transact, uh, I think it's going to be hard for people to deny the value. I think, you know, people, more and more people understand Facebook, Google, and Amazon are selling your data. And, and Facebook keeps having more and more glaring uh, offenses, if you will. So... Uh, you know, I think people are, are starting to realize the value of privacy and especially as it erodes and, uh, you know, tinfoil. Well, and there was that article today about this guy in Canada who got 
kicked off Slack because he has some associates that are Iranian and it's really? uh, apparently it's illegal if, if, with Americans to do business with Iranians. So every company has to kick the Iranians off their platforms. Are I you mean, kidding me? That's, I, I, that's yeah, insane. that's a news story today. And it, 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 it sounds crazy, but censorship it, again. So, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, how, how is, how is Zen helping me stay censorship resistant? So, um, you know, I've seen the, the wallet. So obviously there's a messaging app. I would assume that's end to end. Um, you know, Telegram has the same thing. No cryptocurrency required. Why should I choose Zen over Telegram? Uh, you know, let's talk about that a little bit. What, what is it specifically that's, that's, that is, again, if going back to, if we're talking about, I want user, user experience that's commensurate, uh, looks like I can at least message back and forth. That that's, you know, well, assuming that well let's take a happen. little sidestep on that because this isn't aimed at you right now. You have first world banking privileges. Ah, you have fair, first fair. world technology. Ah, okay. You have all sorts of things that, why don't we say, okay, is there places in the world where people are willing to put up with newer technology because it's a permissionless system? I they don't have to get yes. permission to open a bank account or, or international wire transfers. I mean, I was reading an article about Western Union. There's $600 billion per year of international currency transfers. They get about half of it. Say, they so take a fat chunk of it, too. Billion. I think they take about 7% of that. Yeah, they have right? a huge fee structure. Yeah, huge. And it, and you have to go to the Western Telegram office that gets sent. And whoever uh, is getting money on the other end, they have to go to the Western Union office and get the money. So everybody knows they're getting money. And so um, with Bitcoin, certainly it's an advantage to be able to send it person to person anywhere you want. You convert it to your local currency. I mean, uh, the Bitcoin Standard, excellent book that talks about, hey, if people just keep their uh, money in Bitcoin and convert it to the local uh, currency whenever they want, they can pretty much go anywhere in the world and, and uh, you know, have funds available. What we talk about at Horizon is that over time, Bitcoin addresses can be tracked and narrowed down yeah. to specific... Uh, organizations are individual. Uh, ultimately, it's pseudo anonymity. It's right. You know, just because so of places where you might use cash now because you don't want your bank account or uh, to or, or your bank to know that you're spending money there. I don't know. Uh, at, at a cannabis location, something yeah. involving sex. Uh, when you go down and buy beer every day at the liquor store. Person-to-person uh, right. -person transactions on Craigslist or something like bills. that. How about that? Yeah. You know, I don't want I don't want everybody to know that you know. I mean, let's say for instance, okay, um, um, the you know, like say they have seen that in the past, uh, previously before ACA, when they could rule out pre-existing conditions, etc. Say yeah. maybe you were able to somehow uh, not deal with that so that you could get insurance again. I, you know, I don't know. Again, I'm I'm not saying well, this no, is no, the and right that, that's an important about point it, because uh, keeping, you know, uh, records private. Ultimately. One of my relatives just went through. Um, well, this was a few years ago, but the whole progression of cancer, hospice, yes. death, sure. burial. Right. I don't want that information getting out and getting sales calls. Come right. use our crematorium. Um, right. And that's already happening with medical prescriptions. How you get a prescription from a doctor. Somebody in that doctor's office uh, makes a photocopy of the patient list and gets it to online drug companies and they start calling people and saying, hey, we can just sell you your drugs for less. We know you, you need this, this, and this. It's like, what the hell's going on? Yeah. I need to be able to regain some of my privacy here. Yeah, well, and you know, especially, well, that kind of thing ought to be a HIPAA violation, frankly, but if it's not, you know, just because, because of targeting ads, and again, just uh, Facebook, Google, you know, it happens all the time in the sidebar of everything. Hey, we mm -hmm. know what you like. We'll show you more of what you like. Please buy it. Consume, consume, right? Uh, it's nice to be able to, especially, I think that's a great example. In a time when you're grieving or dealing with that, I mean, I'm, I'm literally, I've been taking care of a sick parent for a month and a half. So uh, that's mm -hmm. a particularly poignant example. And, uh, you know, I, that's not the kind of thing that I want uh, necessarily publicly on, on to available to everybody. I mean, obviously I just talked about it in the internet, but you get my point. Yeah, and then on one end, and, and then I've got four children. I don't want, you know, all the information about them getting out there and stuff like that. They're not right. fully adults yet. Right. Um, and as a sidebar, they're totally unbanked. They, they're not allowed to have a bank account until they're 16. I love it. I mean, there is a massive use case for cryptocurrency. I, was gonna I mean, say, my daughters are avid though? consumers. <laughs> can they have a wallet <laughs> or a mining rig? Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, there are, if you start peeling back the onion a little bit, there are use cases for cryptocurrency. And uh, if you uh, go with that uh, Bitcoin or reg traditional cryptocurrencies can be tracked over time, there's definitely a use case for privacy enabled cryptocurrencies. However, I think we need to get to the point where we can do private um, and anonymous transactions on a phone uh, instantaneously. Uh, once we're at that point, and that's part of the reason why we have the Sphere wallet, because it's going to lead us to that point. But the second part is, that's why we have a whole bunch of nodes out there uh, that these wallets can connect to all over the world. Because there's the ability for uh, countries to do country level firewalls. But if we can make sure we have Zen nodes in that country already, maybe operating on a, a well-known internet port like uh, 80 or 443 or something like that, that all the firewalls let through, um, then, you know, we can make sure the system stays up and running for people to rely on it. I like it. I, I like it. It's, again, it's yeah, I, permissionless. Um, having the ability there. It's in a, in a world where, you know, again, put on your tinfoil hat, but in a world where uh, liberties are continually um, eroded, slowly but surely, and, uh, you know, it, it looks a little more big brothery every day. Hi, NSA. Um, you, know, uh, you know, in a world where that is a reality, uh, it's nice that there are people trying to do something about it um, and, and at least recognizing the value of privacy. Uh, so we got another question from the group. So when Grayscale Investments decided to take a stake in Zen, what do you think they saw in the vision? How do your visions align? Um, talk about that a little bit because, you know, that's a, that's a pretty big crypto investment fund. As, as, you know what as it, investors, it, is. We, and, it was an interesting thing for us to, to take note of. So, yeah, and and uh, you know, and I was talking with a, a local a cryptocurrency investment organization uh, here in Atlanta as well about that. And I mentioned that DCG Grayscale Investment uh, had a fund to allow institutional investors to invest in Zen. And, and again, that's one of the things that uh, Rob Viglione uh, pioneered. He goes and and, and talks uh, to Barry and uh, other folks. He really gets around. I kind of stay in the back end. I, I don't travel as much. But what I can tell you um, is that we put together an experienced team of, of people here at the Zen Blockchain Foundation from a number of different disciplines. Uh, so Rob and I are, are both you know, former military officers. We have uh, management experience. I grew a company to 60 people and sold it uh, and have gone through that entire process. And so the team that we have now is multidisciplinary. We have managers. We have project managers. We have developers. We have two graphics artists. It's amazing how much the world relies on beautiful graphics and videos and right. things like that because we can build a wonderful product, but if nobody knows about it or nobody uses it or nobody thinks it's cool looking, it doesn't do any good. Um, yeah, if, it, if it's and, ugly, no one's going to, I mean, if, you know, I think that's, it could be all the, all the other better features in the world. And if it's ugly and clunky to use, people are still going to be like, eh. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we have an, an, an attorney on staff. And an accountant. I mean, all the things that a small business just, needs to do. Company? How do you know? Yeah, exactly. Now, and, and, and you know, we're, we're a nonprofit out of Delaware, and, and the Zen Blockchain Foundation is the current organization that receives the funds of the Treasury. But these are well established ways of getting things done, setting up, you know, a company, a business to accomplish things. Um, and we absolutely understand. Uh, that we came from a community-focused organization and were very uh, cognizant of the need to, to stay in touch with our privacy-focused uh, and very energetic community, and, as well as turn it back over um, at, you know, as we go through the, the treasury and voting. But I, I think part of what the Grayscale Investment Group saw is that we have uh, the ability to get things done and we have a vision um, and uh, we take responsibility um, to, to get to where we think the project needs to go. I like it, good answer. So uh, this is actually a, a follow-up question specifically about in the down market, obviously protracted bear market. Uh, Robert Gomez wants to know, uh, has the Zen team started to decrease, right? I mean, consensus laid off a bunch of people. Uh, we've heard Dash maybe having some treasury issues, et cetera. Um, has, uh, given that you guys are a real business, yeah, I, I, I can speak to probably a number of other projects that I know that had downsized. Um, have you guys had to go through that at all? How is the, you know, how, how is things on the, uh, the home front from a business standpoint? Are you growing? Are you yeah, uh, so, stable? Um, stable? Uh, our, our 
the funds that we get in are, you can calculate it. It gets, it's about 21,000 Zen per month mm -hmm. that comes to the treasury. And at about $5 Zen, that's about $100,000 a month USD equivalent. And you think of, okay, what's the typical burden cost of hiring a professional person? Like, wow, that's, that's, that's not a lot. So, yeah. um, so, <laughs> so like me and Rob, we've been in this for a while and, and, um, you know, we, we, uh, we don't need a paycheck, so we haven't taken a paycheck for most of the year. Uh, a lot of the bigger, we didn't staff up as much because we had those projects that we did with IOHK and InfoPulse. We've cut back on projects. Sponsorships are pretty much gone. We have uh, reduced staff or converted uh, some uh, activities to community focused. Um, and even so, tightening our belt as much as we can and, uh, and reducing staff, uh, we still aren't hitting the, the numbers. And so we can either cut further. And a lot of these projects that I've talked about, we've pretty much done 60, 70% of the work already. It would be a shame to just let them go. So we decided in our centralized fashion to, in the next mandatory upgrade, double our treasury. So instead of 10% of the new Zen that goes to the treasury, it'll be 20%. And, and, and that'll take effect in January. How, how has the community reacted to that overall? Were they supportive or, you know, I mean, obviously people want things to get built. Um, did people freak out about this? Um, you know, since it's coming from the miners reward, the miners weren't very happy about it. That much I can tell you. Understand. Um, uh, we didn't take it from the uh, secure or super node reward because we're, we're just building that up. Um, we do, we did have an issue with a 51% attack uh, earlier this year, right. which allowed some funds to be taken from an exchange. Uh, we, res we responded by upgrading our software to uh, prevent the possibility of a 51% attack like that from happening again, basically by penalizing hiddenly mined uh, blockchains, so modifying the Satoshi consensus, and that's been in place for a while, and we haven't had an issue since. So we feel that yeah, although we well, know that the overall hash power is going to go down, we're still going to be secure on that side of things. I think most other folks recognize that the overall value of the project and demand for Zen is going to increase if we're able to ship product quicker. So it's, the people have been supportive. And that's it, right? I mean, that's I think that's that's what we've talked about pretty much all year, uh, just among our community is is uh, the the days of here's my white paper and I got a great team. Can we get some money? Is pretty much over. So uh, you know, I as far as any new things. If there's no MVP, don't even talk to me. But uh, it is nice to see that, you know, exactly. Like if you've, if you've built and are continuing to build it, I think that should uh, hopefully give some confidence. And uh, again, speaking of confidence, I thought it was actually pretty commendable that immediately after the 51% attack, you know, Rob went on the media tour. We spoke to him then um, and, and, you know, just addressed it, you know, steered into it, so to speak. Uh, I, I think that speaks volumes, frankly, for the team. Um, from my from my perspective is thanks and that's one of the things that we've tried to consistently do is be transparent if you look all the way back to right after we launched when we were having transaction replays happening um we're close to getting delisted from bitrex um and that was our only exchange and i talked to the owner of bitrex and he's like look i've been in microsoft security for a long time and one of the things i can tell you is um, that when you're having a security issue, you need to talk to people. You need to do an update twice a day until it's taken care of. So I'd be doing videos. You know, Rob would be doing videos. We'd be doing updates twice a day. And, 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 it, and it was difficult. Sure. Um, and sometimes there's no it, progress to report. Dealing with the problems, right? I mean, right. Yeah. Uh, but we worked our way through it. We did not get delisted from Bittrex. Um, and, 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 you know, they've been one, one of our, you know, staunch, uh, exchanges uh since that time so uh and that that's just kind of carried on we do we were doing a bi-weekly update on everything that's going on and wide open uh, question and answer period at the end we've backed that off to once a month uh, first wednesday of every month we do a youtube live stream uh and we try to answer we'll, we'll do an update we try to answer all the questions that people have on that youtube live stream so try to be transparent about what we're doing i think that's also nice and uh, people can catch that on the replay uh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go to our Horizon YouTube channel. Uh, every one of them is archived there. Uh, you can go back and see some of those early videos of uh, me being very worried, uh, but they're all there. <laughs> so uh, we've got another question. So just uh, what are what are some of the biggest challenges you guys are facing right now in Horizon? Like what are, what are you facing? And furthermore, what are you doing to overcome it? Like what what do you guys see that's a problem? Um, 
Yeah, just yeah, yeah. I think one of the biggest issues that a lot of cryptocurrency projects have is uh, that people don't care that they exist, uh, that they don't have a, a purpose, uh, that they don't have a, a reason to be around. The next part is the people that do the software development, the vision, the all, all the other tasks. Pro- in a lot of cases, they don't have a good skill set of technical analysis, coming up with a trading plan, and so they see that this project that they've supported has consistently gone down in price, how the market is, is valuing them, and they don't have the skills to short or take you know ticks here and there and make money because that's a full-time o- occupation. So they just have to buckle down and, and work. Um, so to me, the challenge is, uh, is for people to stay motivated uh, and, and, and to keep working and to, to, not, to not worry. This is, this is experimental software still there's always problems that are coming up all the time um you know minor problems major problems and we deal with them and that's you know basically since we started and sometimes they're just problems of perception you know we have a perception problem right now that we do more marketing than actual software development people have been slamming us for months saying hey you you said you're going to have a new wallet. Well, what one's it going to come out? Never. It's out and it's more than just a wallet. I mean, you know. Right. I've seen, yeah. You know, there's a number and, of and so that are- keeping people motivated. One of the nice things, though, is when, when everything was hyped up and, and people were coming in, uh, there were so many people jumping into the Discord and uh, asking crazy questions and accusing us of doing things nonstop. That's really died down a lot. Thank goodness. So it's possible to have real conversations again. That's yeah. That's a nice. I mean, well, and I think. Just in general, I mean, obviously, interest has waned significantly over the course of the year, uh, and obviously that is in no small part due to the bear market. But uh, you know, I I think a part but of like another another that problem is, that came less up noise, right? There's just, there's less uh, noise, and we can actually get more signal coming through and and uh, focus on. It is, but still, it. when Equihash my Equi- Equihash ASIC miners came out in like May or June, um, uh, you know, we were getting a lot of people demanding that we change our algorithm to be GPU only, to mm. invalidate the ASIC miners. Right. And we were, and, and I see technology progression. You know, I, you know, I saw what happened with Bitcoin. It was CPU mining. It was GPU mining. It was FPT mining. It was ASIC mining. Right, right. Once you get to ASIC mining, that's the most efficient mining. Um, the, the problem is you don't get all that early distribution and support from the GPU miners. Right. Well, it's and so whatever sort of decision we made, half because, the people were going to be angry. I mean, I was going to say, it's also sort of wasteful to have an ASIC miner. I mean, it, to a degree, because you're just building a, a software that does one thing. And frankly, uh, with Moore's Law, those things get outdated so quick. I mean, you know, how many miners just had to shut down specifically uh, as Bitcoin, you know, as as the, uh, the, the cash, the BCH team forks fought it out. And, you know, that had its effect on the market. How many miners had to shut down because... Uh, basically the hardware that they bought was no longer profitable. And you could probably speak to this better than me. I mean, I'm just reading oh, yeah, from that's, the outside. That's, that's near and dear to my heart. So <laughs> uh, one of my propositions and, and, and one of the things that I encourage people to do of building a small mining business on my block operations um, uh, uh, website and, and, and YouTube channel and stuff like that is to keep your costs low, um, keep your costs low, have your uh, electricity costs low, and then have pretty much the latest – so semi-latest equipment. And so I see this right now. So in our uh, bigger mining facility, we're running Antminer S9s, which you've been able to get for two years now. Right. Antminer L3 Pluses, they've been around for probably about a year and a half now. And then Antminer D3s, and then a bunch of GPU miners. We just yanked out all the Antminer D3s. They were so unprofitable, we were losing money on them. And we hadn't even had them in place for a year. So I, I agree that that's and so what do you do with them? I mean, ultimately, they're, you, at a certain point, they just are garbage for resale value. They're worth, oh, yeah, I have to sell them for scrap because, yeah, because right? I mean, uh, the coal tank yeah, and whatever that's else is out there. They're, <laughs> right, 10 times as efficient. So um, I, I don't even know that we made our money back on those. But as the overall uh, Bitcoin hash rate has gone down, because we keep our costs low, our, actually our S9s are still profitable. All right. And... and since we do a little bit of money management, we have money in the bank to pay for the electricity. So if the Bitcoin price comes back up uh, here in the next few months, we can sell then and, and, and have a little bit more profit. Been on a nice little pump the last couple of days. Everybody's freaking out. Oh my God, are we at the bull run? I'm like, guys, we're nowhere near confirmation yet. Like, chill out. Yeah. 
uh, but yeah. Uh, so okay, so we got another we got another question. Just for fun, teach us something we don't know in less than one to two minutes about crypto, or, or that we might not know. Teach us short short lesson. What, what do you got? You've been in the space for a long time. Uh, this could be anything. Oh man. Um, I know way to put you on the spot, huh? Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, in, in my go to on this. Uh, I can go to, um, I've been doing some presentations uh, recently, doing some meetups because remote meetups are a real easy way to, uh, low cost way to do things. Sure. And I was working with Students for Liberty uh, and they have students all over the world. And I'm like, hey, I'll do, a, I'll do a presentation on Bitcoin and Horizon and talk to, and, and so the place where I've been getting the most traction is actually in Nigeria and Ghana. And okay. so it's, it's fun. I just did one yesterday morning. It's fun to be able to talk about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies um, and, and things like that. Uh, and what I didn't realize was actually how important the inflation rate was uh, of Bitcoin. I, I'm like, you know, there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoins. What the heck? Why does the inflation rate matter? Well, the inflation rate matters because um, money is like currency that keeps its value. So if you look at the inflation rate of gold over time, the new gold compared to the gold out, out of the ground, it's about 1.5 to 2%. And that's why people use gold as money traditionally, because it doesn't lose its value. Right. Well, if you look at what the inflation rate of Bitcoin is right so now, it's, I think it's around 5%. And at the next happening, it's going to be around 1.5 to 2%. And that's uh, the next happening is in about a year and a half. Right. So in a year and a half, Bitcoin is going to have an inflation rate similar to gold. So it's all going to have all the properties of new Bitcoin created versus Bitcoin already and in existence. For, for people that don't know gold. about that, that's the happening when the block, uh, the, the hash reward changes. Yeah. So instead of 12 and a half uh, new Bitcoin per 10 minute block, it's going to be 6.25. So um, it's going to have all the attributes of uh, gold, which has been money for millennia, as well as much easier to use, carry across borders and things like that. Um, and so uh, that's going to be an exciting time. Agreed. I, I, the the happening, I mean, that's a lot of people have been asking us, you know, people love a long-term prediction. We don't like to make those because it's crazy. Uh, but saying, you know, when, when end of bear market, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, realistically could be till the, the next happening per, possibly. Um, but in the meantime, you know, it could happen before then there could be other market conditions that come in, but I think that's, that's a, certainly a, a goalpost we've been eyeing and, and we'll keep a watch on in between then and now. But, uh, you know, I think the important thing again, going back to is like, who's still working right now as this yeah. is all, you know, who is, when that is the, the light, you know, and, when whatever light is the next light at the end of the horizon, it's always consensus, and then it's Chinese New Year, and then it's Wall Street trader bonus time, and the, you know it's always it's always something in the crypto markets that's gonna get that next pump and get everybody uh, excited. But I think ultimately, really at this point, I think people should be realistic to realize it's not green candles all the time. It's it's now about actually investing in real companies that are actually trying to develop things and bring products mm -hmm. to market. Yeah, and, and I'm excited about the payment channel th things like you know the the Lightning Network and other uh, other ideas about payment channels uh, that'll make uh, things a, a lot faster. There's a lot of uh, new innovation happening uh, within the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space. Sure. Um, and there's so many different projects in parallel. Uh, one of the things that's a little disappointing to me is how folks in the in the space uh, for a long period of uh, time just refer to anything that's not Bitcoin as a shit coin. Uh, um, and, and I think people, some coins, people who man, do that, altcoins. <laughs> yeah, they're well, they're just too lazy. Well, I there's think. a lot of shit coins. I mean, let's be honest. There yes. is a lot of shit coins. There's a lot of pure scams. There there's a lot of projects that have zero purpose with a blockchain, let alone a cryptocurrency. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's a ton of things that are you know, I mean, Kodak Blockchain Corporation, anyone. Uh, yeah, then, <laughs> or know. they were built poorly, or other things like that. So, I, granted, there there are a lot of uh, shit coins out there. I'm a, I'm with you on that, but there are also valid projects um, that are doing new and creative things that uh, are are you know are going to either prove or not. They might fail, but a lot of those improvements or test beds those can be rolled into Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And it might turn out that the privacy things that we're doing is very important or that Monero is doing is very important, but they might not be important at all. Um, but to just categorically refer to every altcoin as, as a shitcoin to me is, is somewhat disappointing. Yeah, I, I agree. And I mean, you know, it's a, 
I think it's I think they all have a place, right? I mean, Bitcoin does have a place as a and, and I don't even know that Bitcoin right now it's the alpha. It is, you know, it's mm -hmm. Sauron's ring as far as the cryptocurrencies go. But uh, will it always be? I don't know. Um, and I think there is a place for th like, you know, I think Monero has a very valid point. There is absolutely no way not to use privacy on that network that has mm -hmm. its purpose. Right. And then there's also things like, you know, uh, obviously the ability to select between them, you, sending obfuscated transactions or not, uh, also is going to have its place. And especially, um, I think, as depending on how tight regulators want to clamp down, because ultimately, whether we like it or not, uh, no, nobody's switching to a fully decentralized system tomorrow. The whole world's not going to be that way. Uh, and so with that being what it is, there may be certain powers with a vested interest in keeping it the way it is. So dealing with regulation is going to be a factor if we want this technology to actually become uh, widely adopted and used with a real purpose in the world, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're kind of in like an, in a half pregnant stage too. I mean, yeah. we're, we're, everybody's having to deal with exchanges, we're having to deal with uh, dollars and, and government money right. and, and meet all those regulations. It's like, it's like the internet on when it was dial up trying to watch YouTube videos over a, a, a dial up modem. Right? <laughs> the system's not set up for it. Once we're fully away from government money, then uh, things are really going to move. So, okay, so let's talk about that's that's the fun kind of wild speculative uh, predictions I like to make. Mm -hmm. How long do you think until we act? What do you think for realistic widespread adoption? And let's just say that's not everybody uses crypto, but uh, let's say. 15 to 20 percent of the world's population is actually operating and transacting via blockchain or distributed ledger technology. What do you think? Okay. ETA for that. And often, well, sometimes I'll, I'll tell folks, you know, I'm, I'm from the future. I live in the future because all I do is read science fiction books. Yeah, right. and, and so I'm always thinking about the future. Well, they do and of course, William Gibson, Neuromancer, he's like, you know, the future is already here. Yep. Just unevenly distributed. So it's not going to be a categorical, but like you said, 10 to 15 percent. And it's going to be the folks that really um, have the use case uh, for using cryptocurrency. And, and, and um, I think it's going to be folks in other countries where money's failing. I don't know that it's going to necessarily be Venezuela, but you look at um, the way Uber was treated in Argentina. They were not allowed to accept uh, Visa or MasterCard at all. Right. So all the Uber drivers switched over to taking Bitcoin. And why not? So when you yeah. can be when you can be paid with no, I mean, I think uh, you know people. A lot of uh, of of non crypto people are like, well, you, if you send a transaction, that's you can't get it back. I'm like, I posit to you that that is a, a feature and a benefit. Frankly, um, oh, think about that from a merchant. Like, if you've if you've ever run a business, an online business or anything, dealing with chargebacks, um, and, and you know, oftentimes, I mean, you know, as far as our business, we've just run it as a no questions asked like you want to you don't want to do business with us fine we'll we're, we're happy to uh to sort that out but uh you know I, ultimately when you are like if you were selling merchandise online or things like that and you're dealing with a lot of chargebacks uh i think it's actually a pretty interesting feature. oh yeah the settling doesn't happen for 30 days i was hit by that in in, in my business no. uh, one of the new sales people sold some hard drives to somebody out of i don't know chicago and I'm like, what are you doing? That's a new customer. You, you got to get money up front. They're like, wow. oh, that's a credit card. No problem. Two weeks later, yeah. charge back. They canceled the transaction. They still have your merchandise. And what do you? Yep. What can you do about it? Yeah. So I think that's a that's you know again, there's going to be a purpose for blockchain technology one way or another. It's it's definitely it's here. It exists. It's not going anywhere. It's just how is it going to work? Uh, the little boring problems work? have to be solved. Yeah. Well, um, so. Again, until until I can look up Rolf in my phone, that's you know that's a hurdle to adoption right now. And a lot or of for I know, small like, businesses, you guys are gonna add that in your wallet. Uh, I don't know if you know, you know, I'm, I work with the Monarch Project. Obviously, that's something that they're searching for is like username within the wallet, so you could easily search. I mean, and ultimately, that's what it's got to come down to. Again, it's, until it's as easy to use as as Venmo, where I can just look up my friend's phone number and send them money. It's it's right around the corner. I mean, everybody's so close. It's it's I, I you you know you can see it. It's like you said, like living in the future. It's if, if you've got the vision, it's it's right there. I mean, we are so close to it. Uh, That's one aspect of it. Also, it needs to be integrated into accounting systems like QuickBooks. Yes. Uh, it needs to be integrated into existing point of sale systems. There needs to be uh, internal control mechanisms. So if a, a 600 person company wants to use uh, Bitcoin, okay, the salespeople do and, and, and the 
the folks get paid in Bitcoin? Who maintains internal control? Does everybody have a little hardware wallet? Has everybody got an institutional login oh, right. to Mul an exchange? Multi sig, yeah. Multi sig. I don't know. You know, the, all those little boring problems sure. have to be solved. What's, uh, this is something I talk about. I think I think we are way too uh, busy solving. Um, how do I say this? I have found that we are far too focused on building bullshit derivative projects right now, like things like that, than we are with actually, I, like, you know, that's an actual application. Getting Make an SDK that it plugs in with, uh, like, QuickBooks or, you know, uh, any of the Zen Ledger. I don't think that's affiliated with you guys, but that's just another mm -hmm. one that I'm aware of that's a, a bookkeeping software. Um, right. You know, things like that. Like, until it, that that's an actual use case, and when, when things like that develop, and, you know, again, not to... to Shill Monarch, but they're building a, a CMS plugin, so you'd be able to accept merchant payments. And just as companies start to develop more things like that, and people are like, "Oh yeah, this is okay, great." Now I have another alternative to be able to accept payments um, and and transact, or I have another avenue to be able to uh, interact with my uh, with my customer base, mm -hmm. things like that. I mean, you know, there's there's all kinds of all kinds of different possibilities for the way that. Uh, yeah. So, so until that stuff is done, it's going to be okay. The people who already operate outside of regulation, who don't do quarterly reports or taxes, <laughs> uh, or people who don't keep their books, or people who are single person businesses, sure. uh, you know, uh, hustlers, uh, or individual business owners, or, you know, think of all the folks that do person to person cash transactions, and that's the limit of their business. Right. Um, that they're the people that are going to uh, take it on first. But there's a lot of individual business people out there that do lots of different things. You think, you know, handyman workers, um, just all over the place. Well, so th I think that's where it's going to happen first. This, I mean, this was something that I had thought about. Uh, you know, I've, I've got family in Colorado and, and a couple of years back when there was no way to, you know, obviously there was legal marijuana in Colorado. And all these companies had all this money and were like, we can't use a bank. And I was like, why aren't they just using cryptocurrency? I, I just, mm -hmm. you know, and, and obviously then everybody was like, oh, it's pot coin. Again, point, I, you don't have to have pocket. Bitcoin works right. just fine. Uh, and if Bitcoin doesn't work just fine, then Monero or, you know, Zen or one of these, you know, there, there are options available for you. And that was always something to me that I was like, do people just not know that they actually have a place they can park this that's not... Uh, a place that you know that somebody can kick the door in and take it all from them. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, again, wh whether that's that was in that gray area, right? Because legal in Colorado, but still federally illegal. So yeah, uh, that's a perfect use case for you know what you're talking about adoption. I mean, one and, of the things that I learned uh, here um, just from you know local Atlanta Bitcoin meetups is Atlanta's got more Bitcoin ATMs per capita than any other uh, city in the country. That's a fun. Fact. And I'm like, well, why is that? Yeah. Who's actually because everybody's got a side job in Atlanta, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> huh. I mean, huh? What? A, huh? Yeah. No, I love it. That's that's actually that's actually pretty funny. I see them all. So I live in LA, and there's uh, it's it's actually I find this somewhat ironic, right? Because I, I live in LA now, but I've been in San Francisco for years. Is where I've been living, and uh, for as many people as I know that are into cryptocurrency, like heavily either not only working in the space, actually programmers. Um, or just you know heavily involved, go to meetups, organizing meetups, uh, learning to develop on the side, or just have you know traders, et cetera, et cetera. In San Francisco, it's flush with it, right? Very mm -hmm. few Bitcoin ATMs. I live in LA now. Bitcoin ATMs everywhere, and I talk to people. You know, a lot. It's funny, man. I talk to a lot of my friends, and like, you still doing that crypto shit? Like, they're oh, you still do that Bitcoin thing? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I still do. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, so I just I find the irony of. Uh, the availability more, but I, I love to hear that uh, in Atlanta, for whatever reason, uh, <laughs> that there are a lot more Bitcoin ATMs. That's actually that's actually really cool. Yeah. So it's it's happening. It's happening. Yep. I mean, again, it's just uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. I talk about this a lot. You know, uh, we've got to build the roads, and now we need people building the cars. Um, so you know, again, building building the decentralized applications. There's a number of different platforms and way to go. You know, we don't need too many more competitors for world computer or uh you know etc if you get my my uh, mm -hmm. point there we don't need there's a there's a lot of ways to build now i would really like to see uh more developers come into the space uh pick a pick a horse in the race and and build on it and and
and start to see some. Oh stuff. yeah, and, and that's why that's another thing about altcoins. It gives developers an opportunity to actually develop on the Bitcoin code, right? So Zen is inherited from Bitcoin code. So by going through and having our funding and token and paying for development, uh, we've got a, we create a lot of developers that are familiar uh, with cryptocurrency. I, you know, I, so I, Jimmy Song does a great a job going I, around training people, yeah. but you know. We actually pay people to learn how to do this stuff and, you know, do this as well. So just because we're an altcoin doesn't invalidate that we're actually creating uh, and, and helping people to become very proficient in developing in blockchain and cryptocurrency applications. That's I hadn't really. That's a great point. You know, I'd always thought of it the other way, right? Because I'm by no means a Bitcoin maximalist, but um, I am a like I'm a I'm a minimalist. I'm a can we? There are two thousand seventy nine coins on the market and i'd say there's probably 20 that aren't shit coins you know mm -hmm. realistically and uh um i'd say more like 80 to 100 but you know it's sorry. in that range yes yeah. but you know what i'm saying like uh so i have i have often been uh of the opinion that this was dilution right like i think i'm so i hate bitcoin anything that is a bitcoin fork that's that uses the bitcoin i hate it it's stealing brand recognition, and I think of it as dilution, right? Um, but I hadn't considered it from that perspective that it's like, yeah, if we are forking with something that is actually similar to the Bitcoin code base, uh, then technically you are training people that can now build across a variety of blockchains. And it'd, it'd just be learning a little bit of specialization because effectively Monero is a Bitcoin for Litecoin, oh, yeah. a Bitcoin for And they all have their own uh, GitHubs. They all have their own developers. Right. They all contribute. They make updates. They find bugs. I and then really when there's a problem, they got to go dig through the code. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had thought of it more of like, no, it's dilution because, but I, I, I don't know why I was thinking it was like, oh no, this is a totally different code base that a lot of them are actually just sort of uh, a modified replica of the Bitcoin blockchain and code base and, mm -hmm. and you know, with special tweaks from there. But I, I prefer it when somebody, you know, if you're going to take, it's sort of like um, if the lead singer changes in the band, change the band name. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? So, uh, so I, I like it, that, but, I, uh, but uh, also that, that had sort of skewed my thinking a little bit there. Um, mm -hmm. that, you know, I, it, it is a, it's a more positive perspective to think that, you know, that, that they're building, since it is uh, a similar code base, they're actually helping the Bitcoin ecosystem by default as well so mm -hmm. that is that is cool and i truly think the more people that are actually interested and actively working in the blockchain spaces the better it is for distributed le ledger technology as a whole so uh oh absolutely uh, and and one of the things that um uh, i bring up in, in, in my presentation is i don't know if you've read the book the mystery of capital by hernando de soto I have not. um should i yeah it's <laughs> You know, you think Hernando said he's an explorer. He's actually an economist, and he talks at a lot of the Bitcoin conferences. And his team of economists went around the world uh, to five different countries to see how long it would take to set up a legal business uh, or set up a, a to, to yeah to set up a legal right. business. In that. a lot of cases, it would take five to nine years oh my God. Uh, to actually create a legal business. And so, in many of the countries that are overregulated, people don't they need to do something. So they they don't do a regulated business. Um, they do everything outside of the government. So 50, 60, 80 percent of the people live in houses uh, that they can't show that they own. They get uh, electricity from someone else that gets it somewhere else. Uh, you know, all the in um, Rio de Janeiro, there isn't uh, there's all these favelas and the favelas. You know, we heard about that during the Olympics, oh. all these tenement apartment oh, buildings yeah. that are totally outside of the law. Yeah, because if no they tried to be in no running water, no police, no, well, no I mean, they have no, running no water. building codes, frankly. I mean, it's, it's, oh, they do have running. I mean, I've seen, I mean, I've seen well, obviously a lot of the, specifically the like Brazilian favelas and they're, yeah. it's, you know, uh, I hate to use the term shanty town. I don't mean to use that as a pejorative, but like it's, it's tin walls that are sort of just chock a block stuck up to, there's no building codes. There's safety is not the word I would use to uh, describe yeah, structures. and that's a good point, but they don't really have another choice. Right, because of they course, right, obviously. Do it the legal way. Right, it is what and, it is. And one of the things that um, uh, uh, this guy, Hernando Soto, his team, they were in Peru, and this was during the uh, period of the Shining Path guerrillas um, that were uh, you know, attacking the, the government of right. Peru. And they went out into the remote villages, and they would become 
uh, Shining Path uh, supporters. And he asked them, why? Why are you guys supporters of all these uh, rebellion folks? And they said, well, the government doesn't recognize that my family's owned this land for 100 years. Um, and the Shining Path folks, they come and say, oh, well, your neighbors say you own this land? Okay, you own this land. We'll, we'll protect you. We'll recognize that. So it was the recognition of ownership and property rights by this guerrilla group that was the difference that was swaying the opinion. So as soon as the government sent out teams to do what we did in the wild, wild west, you know, with, with uh, when there was gold mining and stuff like that, people were staking claims and shooting each other. All that eventually turned off. into zone property. <laughs> yeah. Zone, I, I mean, zone. that is right. It's like staking your claim, right? That was yeah. literally, and uh, it was like you could go out. Well, and I think there's actually, so uh, I'm in Colorado right now, and there are still homesteading laws here that if you work a piece of property and develop a piece of property to a certain extent, that's your land now. Which is, uh, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure you'd probably get kicked off of it before you could uh, fulfill this requirements now without going somewhere. But just that mm -hmm. kind of thing is, is uh, it's, it's uh, throwback stuff that nobody's really aware of. And, and that's, sort right. of, that's sort of a good metaphor for the way that uh, the Internet is and like Web 3.0 particularly is it's sort of like go stake your claim and build it and that might just be your space. Right, and, and his point is, unless you have capital that you can uh, ac actually, you know, let get a loan on or or sell to people, capitalism doesn't work without capital. Yeah. So that's where I see a lot of these cryptocurrency type projects is being able to bypass the outmoded systems of governments and banks and businesses and quickly recognize and tokenize it, if you want to call it that, uh, all the existing. Uh, capital out there that is not in the current system and make it tradable and loanable and sellable and all sorts of different things like that. There's so there's tons of opportunity for different projects to do those types of things. Well, that's what we've seen. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think 2019 is going to be the year of the STO. People are tokenizing all kinds of things. Well, and again, this kind of goes back to is there a purpose? But I think, you know, like fractionalized real estate, I think is a really great use of uh, potential use for blockchain technology. They did it right there in Aspen, uh, the St. Regis uh, Hotel, right? Exactly. I was going to say, we're already seeing it. There's a number of different projects. Um, so that is a great one. And, and again, you know, I, I think the ability to get fractionalized stocks, because I mean, that was part of what got me into becoming a trader and into cryptocurrency, which you know, frankly has turned me into more of an adult than many things I've done in my adult life. Uh, was just learning about uh, finance and, and trading and, and, and things like that through cryptocurrency. So I think exposure to this sort of thing is actually probably beneficial to people in ways that they would not necessarily expect. Well, I certainly learned a lot about information security, more than I thought I ever was ever going to learn. <laughs> and uh, two-factor authentication and keeping my computer right. systems... More than you might want to learn or like, you know, like the world is a little scarier place now that I know a little bit more about it. Right. Uh, and just but also yeah. but also understanding, you know, sovereign money, uh, privacy, the importance of that, like understanding uh, how economics work and how, you know, capital markets work. This is all stuff that, you know, 20 something me didn't want anything to do with because I never thought it would be applicable to my mm -hmm. life. And it's hilarious because it's always applicable to your life because it's affecting you whether you like it or not, whether you know about it or not. So why not get educated and uh, hopefully be able to maybe, if not steer the ship, at least, uh, you know, have a rudder in the rapids to kind of... <laughs> <laughs> they know to jump out if it's going the wrong direction. Yes, yes, uh, exactly. It's certainly not taught in school, that's for sure. So right. people that want this stuff got to go out and figure it out on their own. Yeah. Well, hey, man, um, we've, I, I only booked this for an hour. I don't want to wrap up your time. Happy to keep chatting with you, uh, certainly. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I want to be respectful of your time. And uh, so is there anything else specifically? Should we talk? What else is what else hot ticket items coming up for Zen? Uh, what can we look out for? Uh, oh, what, one thing I wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. Will you be able to run a full node from the mobile app? Um. You know, I'm not sure that that's going to be the, the best thing to do uh, because right now it takes about 12 to 15 gigs of storage. Of course, oh, your mobile okay. device can could, store. Yeah, well, my, my iPhone could do it, but it'd take up yeah. a big chunk of it. Yeah, but, but the, um, what the Zcash folks have done with the sapling uh, upgrade is change the circuit of the zero-knowledge proof so that the signing of the shield and anonymous transactions uh, doesn't have – the device that does that doesn't have to, have to have access to the full node. 
So you can get the transactions that you need, sign them on your phone, and then send them back to the node. So the idea behind wow. a mobile phone is you'd be able like to- a side chain just within the phone. Uh, that, that would be one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is accessing a full node in a secure manner uh, that doesn't give up your identity um, and be able to do those full zero knowledge proof uh, signing as well. So uh, we're not quite there yet, but that's the one of the upgrades that we're going to do is to get us closer uh, to those types of uh, zero knowledge proof shielded transactions. So, I mean, there's continuous improvement. There's always things that we're doing. I guess what I want everybody to know is, you know, the Horizon team is here. We're active. Um, yes, there's uh, market issues and uh, it's bringing us down and it's brought the treasury down um, and, and, and depressed people a little bit, but we're still moving forward and I'm in it for the long term. I know Rob's in it for the long term. A lot of the folks on the team uh, really feel that our mission of what we're doing, uh, of, of bringing privacy, uh, you know, real institutional grade privacy to the individual user in an easy to use format um, is, is a mission worth pursuing. So we're going to be doing that and keep going at it. Awesome, man. I, I think that's a, a worthy mission. I like it that you guys are, you know, again, not, not necessarily addressing first world problems and uh, are, are committed to the greater good because I, I think that's another thing that um, tends to happen in the community. Uh, you know, just human nature naturally is, is uh, what's in it for me and people forget about uh, doing it for like, what's in it for everybody else. Let's, let's worry about everybody at the same time and not just myself. So I think that's well, right. I mean, ask no yourself the question. If you had all the money in the world that you ever wanted, what would you do with your time? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do something good for people. Exactly. Help people out. And you know, it's a uh, especially good message this time of year, holidays, everybody's uh, yeah, in a giving mood. So thanks yeah. for coming on, man. Appreciate it. Uh, this has been fun. I, I had an unintentional uh, privacy week here on Cryptosomniac with the interviews we've had. So um, this has been cool. You guys are obviously, of course, welcome anytime. Uh, keep us posted if there's any cool stuff. And, um, you know, other than that, like I said, uh, you know where to find me if you need me. But happy, right. happy to chat. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, Chase. Appreciate it. Right on. All right, Rolf. Well, everybody, thank you so much for watching. And uh, uh, we will see you guys tomorrow here on the channel for the regularly scheduled technical analysis and all that kind of good stuff. Hope you guys have enjoyed the content. And uh, thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Keep your stop losses tight.